Yeah, so it's a lot of fun to be here. And uh, <laughs> see how much fun it is. It's a lot of fun. It's kind of dangerous, though. You've got to be careful when you come to the Applied Math Colloquium. <laughs> So my, my goal in this, so it's nice to have a diverse audience of people from, you know, uh, from the chemistry side of things and people coming from operations research and students in applied math uh, in the math department. Uh, so what I'm going to try to do is try to convince you that use, convince the people that come from a chemistry background that using statistics and optimization can be really useful for uh, for chemical engineering and for discovering new kinds of materials, new kinds of molecules, and convince the people that are more interested in, in mathematical methodology that uh, there's a bunch of interesting problems in chemical engineering and in, in chemistry. So this talk is really about trial and error, right? So the most famous, one of the most famous examples of trial and error is Thomas Edison, right? So he perhaps is most well known for his work uh, improving the incandescent light bulb. And the story goes that he was trying to find a material that he could use as a filament that would hold up well uh, and that wouldn't generate you know, so, much, so much black stuff on the inside of the light bulb that it would be unusable. And so he didn't have a good theory for predicting what materials would work well. So what he did is he just tried a huge number of different materials. So, uh, the web told me that it was about 6,000 different types of materials. Another invention for which he's well known is uh, carbon microphone, and so there he's trying out hundreds of different materials. Okay, so this is, this is uh, you know, how Edison did a lot of his stuff, but it's also used in a, in a number of different areas. So one big example where trial and error is used quite extensively is in drug discovery. So there are robots that you can buy if you have a lot of money that will screen uh, hundreds of thousands of different molecules to see how well they work uh, at treating a particular disease. Okay, and so you just you know you just try all of them. So massive amounts of trial and error. Another example where trial and error is used quite a bit is in the development of new polymers, new biomaterials. Okay, so the strategy is just you just work really hard and you try a huge number of things. Okay, and I want to make the claim that doing well in science depends at least in part on your, doing well in experimental science depends at least in part on your ability to do trial and error well. And if we can improve our ability to do trial and error, then that would have a bunch of good effects on science and technology development, right? So there are lots of good projects that, that fail because the trial and error didn't happen to pan out. So if we can improve that, more technology development efforts, efforts would see, succeed. Scientists would take on more ambitious projects, okay? And just, you know, the overall uh, rate at which we do science and improve technology would, would get better. So trial and error, I would argue, has, has three pieces. So Edison famously said that uh, genius is 1% inspiration, 99% perspiration. Right, so making intelligent decisions about which experiments to perform, and also, so that's the inspiration part, and just doing lots of experiments, that's the perspiration part. And then the third piece that I think is important is it's, it's good to be lucky. So what this talk is about is how to do this piece better, how to make better decisions <coughs> about what experiments to, to try. So here's my cartoon view of what trial and error is in science, at least when we're doing trial and error in order to, say, discover a molecule that's going to work well as a drug or to discover a polymer that's going to have the particular properties that, that we want from our, from our new plastic. Okay, so you have some, some expert, some scientist, and he says to himself, I want to find X, where X here is, is say, a, a molecule that you're going to use as a drug or, or some, some, you know, some polymer. Uh, such that f of x is large, and here f of x is measure of quality, okay, maybe how well that, that particular molecule does in treating this disease, where the way that I can evaluate f of x is by running a physical experiment. So the way that the trial and error process works is that the expert, based on some 
some theoretical knowledge, some intuition, proposes an X, does an experiment, gets the result, maybe learns something from the result, and then repeats. Okay? One of the areas that my research that I've been working on and you know as part of my research agenda for a few years is something called Bayesian optimization. So in Bayesian optimization, what we have is some optimization problem. Typically, this optimization problem is one where uh, we evaluate the quality of a particular design, say a, say a design for, for an aircraft wing. We can evaluate that by running some expensive computer simulation. Maybe it solves uh, fluid flow equations over and over and over again. Okay? And running this computer experiment takes, say, hours. All right? But what we want to do is we want to find some input variable x such that the output from our expensive simulation is large. Okay? And in, in Bayesian optimization, and more generally in optimization of expensive functions, what you have is you have an algorithm that says to himself, well, I want to find some x such that f of x, my objective function, is large. Proposes an x, you run the computer simulation, you get the answer, maybe you learn something from the answer, you propose a new x, and you repeat. Right? So this loop looks a lot like the loop that you have in trial and error. So the, the thesis of this talk is hopefully a very simple and an obvious thesis, which is that these two things are similar and maybe we can learn, maybe we can use some of the algorithms that work well for optimization of expensive functions uh, here in the context of science. If you're familiar with, with Bayesian optimization, you know that it goes back at least to Kushner's paper in 1964 with a lot of developments uh, from Marcus, uh, Zelinskis, a number of people. So it's a, it's a relatively old area. Um, and how things work in Bayesian optimization is, so what we do is we, we have a bunch of data. Typically, they're data that we collected by running some computer simulation, some expensive optimization model. We build a Bayesian statistical model that predicts f of x, right, that predicts f as a function of x. And then based on this statistical model, and not just the predictions, but also the uncertainty in that statistical model, we do what's called a value of information calculation, okay, and this is an idea that was uh, the, the first place that I know about it in the literature is Ron Howard in 1966, that does this calculation which says what the value would be of doing a function evaluation at a new location, and then tries to find the new location for which the value of information is largest. Okay? Suggests the point with the largest value of information, does the experiment at that point, and then repeats. Okay? So that's the basic loop inside Bayesian optimization. Okay, you can also see this as a surrogate optimization technique where uh, the, the statistical model is really, is really a surrogate that you're building and then you're using this surrogate in order to uh, make decisions about where to evaluate this objective function. I also, so I, I, I have this term optimal learning that I use to describe uh, problems where you're doing statistics but at the same time you're asking yourself what kind of data uh, you should collect in order to make those statistical models as good as you can. Uh, so Bayesian optimization is, you know, I would call this an example of, a, of an optimal learning method. Okay? So what I'm going to talk about is some science projects where we apply Bayesian optimization to the, the trial and error process. So this is how, uh, this is how things work in this, in this particular context. So we have some expert our scientific collaborator, okay? And this expert has a lot of expert knowledge about the problem uh, that, that, that we're working with them on and gives to us, or we elicit from her or him, a Bayesian prior probability distribution. And also, that expert, typically when we meet them, has already made some decisions about some experiments that he or she is gonna run and has run those experiments and has some data from those experiments. So we take that data and that prior probability distribution and we build the custom Bayesian statistics model and we use that to make some predictions along with some associated, uh, some associated uncertainties about those predictions which we then pass to a value of information analysis which we then use to make recommendations about some next experiment to run 
we feed it to the expert who may look at those and say, that's garbage, I'm not gonna do that. Or if we've done a reasonably good job, we'll actually do those experiments, give us more data, and we repeat, okay? And I wanna argue that although you can see applying this kind of methodology across science, that chemistry, chemical engineering, material science, medicinal chemistry, these are places where it can be particularly fruitful to apply these kinds of methods. Because, first of all, experiments, chemistry experiments are often quite expensive. So the, the, the example, the sort of extended example that we'll go through the rest of this talk will be one in which uh, the experiment takes uh, several weeks. And so because the experiments are so expensive, the number of experiments we can do is a limiting factor in how much science you can do. Okay? Moreover, there are good statistical models that already exist for making predictions in the context of a lot of these chemical problems. Okay, so all the ingredients are there, and yet a lot of experimentalists are today, I mean this is not a, true across the board, but in it's it's but many experimentalists are making decisions about which experiments to run without support from quantitative analysis. Okay, so there could be there's a lot of room for improvement, I would argue. Um, I want to make the point so that we're not the only ones who are trying to improve uh, trial and error in chemistry. So just a quick kind of survey of the literature as I see it um, on different kinds of approaches for tackling this problem. So one is classical experimental design, and I would include what we're, gonna, what we're doing as an example of Bayesian uh, experimental design. There's also a lot of work in what I would call you know, pure prediction for doing, uh, for doing this, part of, this part of the process, right? So given some data, maybe given some expert knowledge, make a prediction for what's gonna happen. Okay, so chemoinformatics and quantitative structure activity relationship models, and we see those as complementary to the approach that we're pursuing here. There's also a lot of theoretical work building high fidelity computer simulations that are able to predict what's, what are, what's gonna happen uh, in the context of, of different chemical systems. There are also very clever experimental approaches that people have for sort of increasing the number of possible materials that you can try out simultaneously. And then there's also a lot of work in you know, high throughput screening and just kind of uh, robotics for, for doing that well. Okay? so. That's a high level pitch for why I think it's interesting to think about experimental design in the context of molecular discovery. And we've been applying this in a number of different projects. Uh, what I wanna do is I wanna take one of these projects, developing reversible protein labels, and I'll tell you what that is. I'm gonna take one of those projects and I wanna talk to you about it in detail and show you how we actually use these methods and convince you that it's useful and convince you that there's some interesting math there. So this is joint work with um, Jiaolei Wang and Hu Yang, who are PhD students in Ori, and then also a number of collaborators at UCSD, Mike Burkhardt, Nathan Gianeshi, uh, uh, and a number of others. So, all right, I need to tell you a little bit about biochemistry. So it turns out, and this is cool, I think, I think it's cool, that you can attach fluorescent labels to proteins. So what is a protein? A protein, we're all made out of different kinds of proteins. Proteins are sort of the most fundamental building blocks of, you know, of life. And so you can, scientists can, can take just fluorescent little chunks, small proteins, and embed them inside larger proteins and make them glow. So here are some pictures, stolen from the web, of different structures uh, that, to which scientists have attached different fluorescent labels, okay? So it's not only cool, you can get a Nobel Prize. You can, yeah, so the, the green fluorescent, pro, green, GFP, green, green fluorescent protein, uh, you know, was the first one of these, so it's a protein from a jellyfish, and uh, probably these, I don't know, PGFP, so that's probably some modified 
uh, DSP. Um, yeah, so they won the Nobel Prize for this. So, uh, so that's maybe, that's just validation that, that this is interesting. And the reason that they won the Nobel Prize for this is because it's super useful. It allows you to track proteins moving around inside living systems, which lets you do all kinds of really important science that you couldn't do otherwise. So the thing that we're interested in, in the context of fluorescent labels, is that although you can attach them to stuff and you can make them glow and you can use that to track stuff, as it, track proteins as it moves around you know, a mouse or a jellyfish or whatever, uh, it's hard to remove these tags. And that prevents you from doing a number of interesting imaging studies uh, that you would like to do. Okay, so if we could remove these fluorescent labels uh, from a protein and you know, have much more control over Okay, now it's going to glow, now it's not going to glow. The protein moved from this part of the animal to that part of an animal, and so uh, we're going to image things in a different way. You would have a lot more control, and you could do a lot more. Uh, you could do a lot more. Okay? And if you had the ability additionally not just to attach uh, fluorescent labels, but kind of arbitrary other things to proteins, for example, if you could attach a uh, protein called biotin that would allow you to. Uh, get the protein to which it is attached to bind to something that you could hold, maybe some kind of bead, then you could pull this protein out of a living system, okay? Then you could remove this, this kind of uh, piece of sticky tape to it, attached to it, this biotin. You could remove that biotin from it, and then you could attach some fluorescent label to it, and then you could put this protein back inside of the system, and then you could watch it move around. Okay? So our goal is to create this kind of a reversible labeling system that gives you a lot more control over, over the ability to image proteins inside of, inside of living things. Okay? So just a little bit more. This is the only, I think the only chemical formula that I have on my slides. Uh, just a little bit more detail about how we're going to do this. So in order to create this reversible labeling, right, to be able to make things glow and then not glow, I need to find a peptide. So what is a peptide? A peptide is a short protein. Okay? It's really a sequence of letters. So I need to find a peptide that allows two different chemical reactions to occur. One chemical reaction is going to be the thing that makes it glow. The other chemical reaction is going to be the thing that makes it stop glowing. Okay? If you know about biochemistry, I'll tell you a little bit more. So. Um, this is our protein. The X's here are letters that we want to figure out. And this S, this is, uh, this is a particular amino acid. So peptides are, peptides are composed of amino acids. So this S is the amino acid serine. And the way that these two chemical reactions work is that the first one is with an enzy enzyme called PPK, uh, which attaches this kind of big structure and at the end of this big structure, you, you can attach anything you want. For example, you can attach a red dye, a red dye okay? And what this chemical reaction does uh, for peptides that have the right structure is it attaches this big thing to the S, to the serine, okay? And now, this peptide glows, and if this peptide is embedded inside of a larger protein, then that larger protein grows, glows. Then there's another chemical reaction called ACPH, ACP hydrolase, which removes this whole structure from that peptide, okay? And now the peptide has stopped glowing, and again, if that peptide is embedded inside of a larger protein, that larger protein has stopped glowing, okay? So if I could find a peptide that allows these two chemical reactions to occur, that would allow me to create this reversible labeling system, okay? So that's, that's one thing. All right, it so needs you say you can only turn it off once. No, so now it's here, and I could do this same reaction again. So if, if, if it doesn't have this, this uh, phosphopantothenol arm on it, then you can, again, run this reaction with the uh, phosphopantothenol transferase, and you can reattach this to it. And they've done, ex with the, so the punch the punchline of this is going to be that we've discovered you know we've used these machine learning these optimal learning methods in order to discover peptides of this form and they've run experiments where they've repeated this uh, four times so you are able to repeat it at least to some extent maybe maybe at some point it starts to degrade I don't know 
Okay. Other questions? Yeah. Exactly. Uh, they only tried it four times because yeah. then they didn't want to anymore, or the fifth time is better? <laughs> uh, my understanding is they just didn't want to anymore. I think, I, I don't know, I don't know. You know, my knowledge of the chemistry is actually very shallow. Uh, I know a few things, but you know, as soon as I get off track, as soon as you ask me one question about the chemistry, I'll, I'll have to defer to my collaborators. Yeah, I don't know, I don't know. Maybe the experiment gets hard to do after you repeat it four, four times. Yeah, other questions? I'll try to answer them. Okay, um, so the goal, right? The goal is to find a peptide that has these two, that allows these two chemical reactions to occur. We're gonna ex extract that property and we're just gonna call it, that's the property of being a hit, okay? So that's the first thing, we need to find a peptide that's a hit. The second thing, it turns out, is that if the reversible labeling system is gonna be useful, this peptide needs to be short. Maybe it needs to be like 10 letters long. And the reason is that if it's really long, if it's like hundreds of amino acids long, then it's gonna break whatever the original protein in which it was embedded was intended to do, right? It's gonna change the function of, of that protein, okay? So we wanna find short hits, that's the goal. And the challenge is that hits are rare. So we don't ex exactly know how rare they are, but the estimates from our collaborators are that maybe one in 10 to the fifth uh, uh, peptides is a hit. So that's one challenge. Another challenge is that testing peptides for these two chemical reactions is expensive, okay? So it requires reserving time on this expensive machine for which my collaborators can get time maybe you know, once every few, once every few months. And then once you get time on the machine, then it's about, say, a week's worth of work by an experimentalist, and then there's several thousand dollars in materials costs, okay? So, and each time you get access to the machine, you can test 500 peptides in a batch, all right? And the problem is that 500 is smaller than 10 to the fifth, all right? So if you divide 10 to the fifth by 500 and multiply that by a month, you know, that's how long it would take to, to test all of these. And that's too long for this project to work, all right? So what we wanna do is we wanna make intelligent decisions about which peptides to test in order to reduce the amount of experimental effort that you need in order to discover this thing and to maximize the chance that this project succeeds, all right? And the one other thing I wanna tell you is that uh, to help us, we have some, some known hits. These come from organisms uh, for which these two chemical reactions are required uh, just for the basic functioning. Uh, 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 so um, these two enzymes occur in nature and so there are some, some longer, much longer proteins for which these are known to work. And so we can use that as initial data in our algorithm. Okay, right. So we're gonna provide a mathematical method. So we call it, you gotta have an acronym, cool. Peptide optimization with optimal learning. And it's gonna have two pieces, like I told you before. So the first piece is a prediction piece, so we're gonna predict which peptides are gonna be hits. And then based on those predictions, we're gonna make a recommendation about peptides to test next. Okay, same diagram. So let me start out and I'm gonna tell you about the statistics piece. So the statistics piece is you know, so, some of you have seen this kind of thing before, and for you, I think it will be, uh, you know, quite uh, not surprising, but others of you maybe haven't seen this kind of thing before, and so I'd like, I'd like to tell you about it. So we're gonna use a technique that's called naive base. Um, we're gonna need to modify it just a small amount in order to adapt it to our problem. So naive base, so it's a standard approach from statistics, machine learning, used a lot in information retrieval for text classification, probably the most famous example. If you look up naive Bayes on the web, you'll probably find an example that's based on spam filters, where I have text, and based on the words that appear in that text, I wanna classify that text as to whether or not it was an email that was spam or an email that was not spam, right? It's called naive because it, it makes a particular independence assumption that I'll show you, but even though it has that name, it, it often works really well. So we're gonna apply a variant of naive Bayes 
uh, to our problem, and it, we're going to modify it in order to include uh, the effect of the position of the amino acid relative to the place where this, remember, this arm attached to an S, to a serine, to model the, the influence of that position. Okay? So the way this is going to work is we're going to assume that reality is characterized by a pair of latent matrices, uh, theta hit and theta miss. So let me just remind you. So I have this serine, S, okay? And then there's positions to the left and to the right. And I'm going to call this position 0, position 1, 2, minus 1, minus 2, etc. And this ma these two matrices, so this will be theta hit, uh, on the columns, that'll correspond to different positions, right? Uh, so this will be position, this will correspond to position minus 1, position plus 1. I skipped the 0 because I don't need to model the effect of this area, position 2, position minus 2. And then along the rows, I'm going to have the different amino acids, right? So A, C, D. And at each cell in this matrix, what I put is I put a number, which I don't know, but a number that's supposed to be uh, among all peptides that are a hit what fraction of those peptides have an A at position minus 1? What fraction of those peptides have a C at position minus 1, et cetera? Right? So if I knew for every peptide in the universe whether it was a hit or not, I could create this matrix. Theta hit is that matrix for all the hits. Theta miss is the corresponding uh, matrix for all the misses. Okay? So if I knew what those, the, the assumption that Naive Bayes makes is that if I knew these two matrices, and I knew a particular sequence, a particular peptide, which is a sequence of these letters, then the probability that y of x is equal to 1, y of x is a binary variable, which is 1 if that's a hit, and 0 if not, that we could model it as being proportional, proportional to some overall fraction of hits in the universe times the product over all positions of the, uh, the, the, the corresponding cell in the theta matrix uh, for that position and that particular amino acid, right? So if I had a peptide that was, you know, uh, A, C, S, A, then this product here, you would just get it by first uh, you're at position minus 2, you've got an A there, then you're at position minus 1, you've got a C there, then you're at S, you skip over that, then you're at position plus 1, and you've got an A there. So you multiply these three numbers together. Okay? Um, so this is the, the sort of the, 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 the parametric model assumed by naive Bayes. Um, and what we want to do is, you know, when we, when we, when we, we when we apply this model is we want to learn what these two matrices are based on data. Okay? So you can imagine, you know, a, a simple kind of a model would be that you take all of the hits that you've got and for each position you would count up how many A's you got, how many C's you got, how many D's you got, and then you would just take the empirical fraction of each of those, each of those amino acids at that particular uh, at that particular position, and that would be, you know, one estimate of this theta hit, this theta hit matrix, and you could do a similar estimate of, of theta miss. We're going to do something that's basically that, but that's epsilon more complicated, and we're going to we're going to smooth this estimate using a prior distribution. Um, if you're familiar with Bayesian statistics, then you've seen this kind of thing before. If you're not familiar with Bayesian statistics, I'm going to claim that this is a detail, and you don't have to worry too much about it. Yeah. What exactly do you stop? You stop uh, once you get one hit? So in practice, we stop when my collaborators decide that they've had enough and want to want to submit the paper. Um, 
Yeah, so we've done like five rounds of experiments over the course of a year and a half, and we found several hits. And it turns out that what happened is that after we found a bunch of hits, they got super excited and they, they asked about an extension of this method that you could use to create a, an orthogonal labeling system. Like one peptide makes it glow red, the other one makes it glow green, and then you can control which one is red and which one is green via different, uh, different enzymes at different points in time. Um, so, uh, yeah, so I guess the decision to stop is kind of based on external factors, and we don't really model that in our problem. But, um, and this I'm asking is if you decide to stop once you get one hit, uh, you do not update the hit and wait with the whole world. That's right. Uh, well, so we're doing, we're doing our experiments in batches of size 500. So even if you stop after a single batch, you're still going to be doing an update of, 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 size 100, of size 500, yeah. And our initial data set had maybe 10 peptides in it, so there was you know, a little bit of updating of, of this matrix at the start. Other questions? But after you find a few hits, I mean, why would you, why would people continue want to view the database or, or they find a shorter one or what? It's always a shorter Yeah, they want to find shorter ones. And uh, something else that I didn't tell you is that there's a reaction constant associated with this reaction. And so you might want to find, like there's the quality of a hit. There's like how good it is. Um, so, uh, so that's another reason to continue to so continue. For them, these it's lifetime search is okay, right? Is that the lifetime? Or at yeah. least you know it's a research program over the course of a few years. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, they have like an army of people who are working on this. It's amazing how much how much resource is devoted towards this towards this project. Yeah, yeah. So how good the data is? Can you model? Uh, Not with naive Bayes. So naive Bayes is for predicting binary variables, uh, and the quality of a hit, we're, we, I mean, that's an extension to this work. We'd like to model it as a real number, and so we should be using some kind of a regression. You can do, you can do categorical variables using naive Bayes, uh, but, and you could treat one and two and three and four as categorical variables, but that model wouldn't know that two is bigger than one. It wouldn't be exploiting that information. So I think a regression model would be a better model. Um, that's an extension that we haven't figured out yet. But the experiment, the experiment that people can tell you the how good the data is. Yeah, so what you get, I should have had some data in here. Uh, what you get is you get, a, a, they have these um, membranes, so it's like a bunch of cells, and then the cells will glow. Uh, and you take a photo, and the quality of the hit, one way to measure the quality of the hit is you look at how bright it's glowing. What you'd like to see is when you attach the red dye, it glows really bright. So I basically what I get is I get two photos. So after they did this, uh, I get a photo and I want to see it glowing bright. And then after this, I want to see nothing. Right? That's a super high quality hit. Yeah. So just to clarify, yeah. is your ultimate goal to increase the number of hits among the experiments conducted or to get better hits? In the mathematical model that I will present to you. My goal is to find, I'll, I'll actually present two optimization models. The first is to find at least one hit. So that models, I'm going to stop afterward. The second one is to find a hit that's as short as possible. Uh, so those are, those are, now from a mathematical point of view, that's what I'm going to do. In practice, what is our goal? It's, you know, like always, right? It's all these competing goals. And yeah, they're interested in a diverse collection of hits. And even just to model what it is that they want. I'll be very specific in the optimization about what I'm assuming that we're trying to do. Other questions? Okay. Um, all right. So I have a so I can estimate this theta hit and this theta mi miss matrix. Uh, one way is I get what's called a maximum a posteriori estimate, which is, which is essentially this counting approach that I told you about, but where I kind of add some initial counts that come from, that I elicited from my collaborators uh, to, make, to make the answer uh, work better in the small data regime. Um, 
And that's good. So that's the math estimate. And then I can also get, uh, it turns out that you can, um, you get a full probability distribution, a full posterior probability distribution over what this theta hit and this theta mix, miss matrices are. And it turns out that that posterior distribution, you can write down analytically, and it's a, it's a collection of Dirichlet distributions. And it's easy to sample from that distribution. And so what another thing that I could do is instead of getting a single estimate, a math estimate, I could get uh, an arbitrarily large number of different samples of possible theta hit and theta miss matrices. Okay? And so I'll talk about approaches that, that use only the math estimate, and those will be faster but not quite as good. And then the ones that use all of that use a sampling approach, uh, and those will be more expensive but, but higher quality. Okay. So first, just a quick kind of rule of thumb. I'll show you what's called an RLC curve, receiver operating characteristic. So this is a measure of the performance of a classification method. Uh, so this was after we, we created this after uh, observing about 300 peptides, most of which are misses. And so what we do is we um, uh, we calculate. We do what's called leave one out cross validation, where you hold out a peptide. Uh, you know what the actual, whether or not it was a hit because you did an experiment on that, but you train your model using the rest of the peptides, and then you get a probability that that, thing, that peptide was a hit, and then you take a threshold, and uh, you're going to vary this threshold uh, for a particular value of the threshold. If the probability that it was a hit is above the threshold, then you call it a hit. If it was below the threshold, you call it a miss. And for a given value of the threshold, you get a true positive rate and a false positive rate. And then you vary this threshold and you trace out this curve. And what you would like to see, uh, a perfect classification method, would allow you to get a true positive rate of one with a false positive rate of zero. And a really bad classification method would be one that would be along this line, which would be the same as just flipping a coin and look, uh, would be the same as choosing a uniform random number and looking at whether that uniform random number was above the threshold or not. So we're somewhere between, you know, really bad and really perfect. Uh, you know, we're sort of getting some predictive power from this model, but it's, it's not perfect by any means. Okay? So now what we want to do is we want to take the output from that statistical model, and we want to pass it through a value of information analysis, and we want to use that to make recommendations about the next experiment to run. So, why is this interesting to think about? And I want to argue that it is interesting to think about, and it's really important to think about. So if the predictions were perfect, right, what we could do is you just take the predictions and you do what the, you pretend that the predictions are correct, and then you do what the predictions say, so you test the shortest peptide that's predicted to be a hit. Okay? But our predictions are not perfect, so how should we decide what to test next? So here's one simple strategy. And I, I argue that this is typically the way that machine learning methods, statistics methods, are used in the context of molecular discovery problems. So take all those peptides, take all the peptides in the universe with length less than, say, 12. And the reason I chose 12 is because there was a previously published paper that had a peptide that was a hit whose length was equal to 12. So if we want to do better than that previously published paper, we want to find, we want to find one that's, a hit that's shorter than 12. So we take all those peptides in the universe, and we just rank them by the predicted probability of a hit according to our model. All right? And then, OK, this 300 should be, should be 500. So I take the, the amount of capacity in my experimental apparatus, and I just test them from most likely to be a hit to least likely to be a hit. Right? But the issue with this is that these top 500 peptides are going to be pretty similar to each other, right? If my model thinks, you know, if my model thinks that one peptide is a hit, it's probably going to think that, it, that another uh, peptide really similar to it is also going to be a hit. So they're very similar. And so if it turns out that the first tested peptide is not a hit, then the other ones are probably also not going to be a hit either, right? You're not going to have any diversity in this set of experiments that you're running. So here's a simulation experiment where I simulated data. I took uh, training data, I fitted the model, and then I simulated uh, fake, hit, miss 
uh, realizations from my model. And I looked at the probability of finding a short hit, finding a hit whose length was less than 12, as a function of the number of peptides that I tested uh, using this approach, this kind of what I'll call the naive kind of rank by probability of a hit approach that I showed you on the previous slide. And what you see is that it's close to zero. It's not exactly zero. It's approximately equal to the probability uh, of getting a short hit when you test only one peptide, okay? Because you're not getting any diversity. And if you compare that to the method that they were going to use if I weren't there, uh, which would be to take all the known hits and just kind of mutate them uniformly at random, you find out that that approach, which doesn't use any statistics at all, does much better than this supposedly, you know, this one that, that uses statistics, but then does something naive with the answer. So I'm going to show you that using value of information, using the same statistical model, you do much better. So, um, we sh I argue that we should be thinking about this in a decision theoretic way, okay? We have a goal, so for the purposes of this discussion, let's suppose that our goal is to find at least one short hit. So find short hits, and the goal is to find at least one hit shorter than some target length B, okay? And so what I should do is I should find the experiment to run that's going to maximize the probability of reaching this goal. All right? So that's a combinatorial optimization problem. It's this particular combinatorial optimization problem. So S, that's going to be the set of peptides to test. E, that's the set of all peptides. So what I want to do is I want to find a, a subset S of the space of all peptides whose cardinality is less than or equal to the overall number of peptides that I can test in my experiment, say 500, and I want to choose this subset so as to maximize the probability that there's at least one short hit in the subset that I decided to test. Okay? So, like many combinatorial optimization problems, the feasible space is really big. The size of this space, that's the cardinality of E, which is the number of all peptides, that's E choose K. So if I'm looking for one whose length is shorter than 15, and I'm going to test 500 peptides, then that turns out to be roughly 10 to the 19th, which is already a big number, 10 to the 19th choose 500. Yeah. Is um, the function like SP here a submodular function? Because yes. It seems very much like Exactly. So, so, yes. So P is monotone submodular, so we're going to do so if you, if, you're, if you work in combinatorial optimization, you saw this coming, and you knew that uh, the, the objective that I'm going to solve is what's called monotone submodular. So that means that even though my combinatorial optimization problem would seem to be very difficult to solve, there's a good approximate approach that should work reasonably well and that has a theoretical guarantee on how well, how well it does. Okay. Um, so, but if you're not from combinatorial optimization, let me tell you that more slowly. Um, okay, so what we're going to do to solve this problem is we're going to build up the set of peptides to test in stages. So in each stage, we're going to add the peptide that's going to most increase the probability of reaching our goal. So we're going to solve this much easier optimization problem. So we're going to look over all the peptides that are, you know, in the space of peptides, but that we haven't already decided to include into our experimental set. And we're going to choose that new peptide to add so as to maximize the probability that there's each, at least one short hit in the, the old experimental set together with this new peptide that I'm throwing in. Okay, So then I'm going to add E to S and then repeat until this set of peptides has 500 in it. Okay, And so it's relatively straightforward to show uh, that um, uh, this function from the previous slide, the, prob the probability that S contains at least one short peptide, it's easy to show that that's a monotone submodular function. And so if you look at the performance of the subset S that you get by this kind of iterative approach, which is a greedy approach, if you look at the, the probability that at least one short peptide is in that set, um, as obtained by the greedy algorithm, and compare that to the probability that you get 
uh, from solving the combinatorial optimization problem exactly, right? So op minus minus three. Uh, so op would be bigger than three because it's better. Uh, and then I normalize by dividing by the out value of the optimal policy. Um, uh, ideally, what I would want is that would be equal to zero. Then greedy would be the optimal policy. It's not going to be zero, but it's going to be bounded above, it turns out, by this quantity, one minus one over e. Okay? And this, this follows from this fact and uh, a result uh, from Nemhauser, Wolsey, and Fisher uh, in the 70s about approximation guarantees for monotone submodular functions using the greedy approach. And there's been a lot of work in this style. Um, I'm pulling out a paper by Andreas Krause as being particularly similar because kind of the style of this thing is sort of similar to this and because it's a learning problem. Um, and Andreas has been working a lot on, on learning problems. Okay, so this is kind of in the style of that literature. Moreover, um, so the, the greedy algorithm requires me to look over a space of peptides Space of peptides, you know, it's much smaller than the space of subsets of peptides, but it's still a pretty big space. Okay, it still can be like 10 to the 10, you know, 20 to the 10, something like that. Um, and uh, so that's not necessarily an optimization that you can solve by writing a for loop in Python on your laptop. Uh, but it turns out that there's an, uh, there's an easier way to do it. And what I want to show you is that uh, it turns out to be equivalent to finding the peptide to add that maximizes the probability that it is a hit, given that all of the previous peptides that were included in your experimental set S are misses. Okay? And that's computationally convenient because it means that, okay, an easy way to calculate this is you just add in all of these results as kind of fake results and retrain your model, okay? And that's this probability, okay? So that makes this thing easy to compute. Moreover, if you're using a map estimate, then this probability turns out to just be a product over choices of, it's a product over columns of an estimated theta matrix where you're choosing which row from each column to add. And so this problem, you can decompose it across location uh, and solve it re really fast, really fast, okay? Really what you do is for each position, you choose the amino acid for which the ratio of the theta hit entry to the theta miss entry is largest, okay? Makes it really fast. Um, Moreover, we can use that kind of equivalent formulation of the greedy to get some additional, I showed you before that this value of information approach works better and I argued that it was because it was more diverse. So let's take this kind of equivalent formulation and, and maybe show you that a little bit more. Okay, so I showed you that the greedy thing, finding the peptide to add that maximizes that there's a probability that there's a, at least one short hit in S mean E. I showed you that that's equivalent to finding the peptide to add that maximizes the probability that this new one that I've added is a short hit, given that there were no previous short hits in S. Okay, these two are equivalent. And I told you that these two are better than this one, the rank by probability of a hit approach. And what that does is it chooses the peptide to add that maximizes the probability that E is a short hit. Right? So they're both, both of these approaches are choosing the one that has the largest probability of being a short hit, but this one is a conditional probability. It's conditional on nothing that I previously added was a short hit. So what this will do is it will push me away from the ones that I already added. It will make me more diverse, okay? That's why this thing works. So here's the graph again. So after only, you know, 100 peptides, the probability of finding at least one short hit is, is close to one. Okay. Um, there's one shortcoming of this, which is that you can usually, in, you know, if I have a peptide that's short, I can usually add an amino acid to it so as to increase the probability of a hit 
by choosing the, you know, choosing the amino acid for which this ratio of theta hit to theta miss is large. So the ones that are the ones that are going to max the, the peptides that add that are going to maximize this probability of at least one short hit are going to have a length that's kind of as large as possible, but that's still you know, short enough to be called a short hit. So we're going to have length B minus 1. However, you know, my real goal, it's not to find at least one peptide whose length is B minus 1 or shorter. I really want, you know, if it's even shorter than B minus 1, that's even better. Okay? So if I wanted a strictly shorter peptide, we might consider an alternate goal. And one natural goal would be what's called expected improvement. So I just... Um, so let f of x, let that be the length of the peptide. And then if I have a set of peptides that I've tested s, let f star be the shortest length among those peptides in that set who that are hits. Okay? And then, uh, and, and then if there are no hits, this is infinity, positive infinity. Then I'll define the expected improvement as so the difference between the length of the shortest previously known peptide, the shortest peptide that I found in my set, so this is how much shorter I got as a consequence of this experiment. If this is positive, that's an improvement. And if it's negative, my improvement is zero. So I'll take the positive one. So the expected improvement I define to be this expectation, where the expectation is taken over the uncertainty on y of x, what x is in x. Right? So it seems like a good goal. Yeah? Does it really fix the problem? Because um, with, if with non-zero probability you haven't had a short hit, then the expectation would be infinity anyway, wouldn't it? Uh, well, the improvement, because you, the improvement ah. can never be worse oh. than, than zero. Okay. Uh, um, so you know, my, uh, my claim, I don't really have experiments to back this up. My claim is that you know, this should do something kind of natural in terms of if you're worried about not having any hits at all, it would choose a bunch that have length B minus one in order to be pretty sure that you're gonna get one. And then as you're pretty sure that you're gonna get one, it's gonna start having B minus twos, B minus threes. Uh, yeah, that, that's the kind of behavior that we expect from this. Okay? Now, okay, again, this is a tough combinatorial optimization problem, but you can also show that this, as a function of S, is monotone to modular. So that means that the greedy approach is going to have the same guarantee. But the issue is that just doing the greedy step now no longer decomposes in a nice way across, across the amino acid uh, location. So we don't know how to do it. Um, uh, and so this results in this are currently pending. Okay? Um, so, but what we do, what we've been doing is a uh, total heuristic approach is that we. Um, so we randomly, we pre-select a random sequence of lengths, A1 through AK, that are all strictly less than B. And then we just require that the end peptide, we use this probability of improvement approach with the greedy, greedy step, and we just require that the end peptide that we select has length less than or equal to AN. And so in practice, they're gonna have length equal to AN. And then we just apply the, the greedy probability of improvement um, algorithm. And so what we, what we find is that for our data set with the number of peptides that we're testing, this improves the, you know, for a given set S, you can calculate the expected improvement. This improves the probability of improvement without really hurting the probability of at least one short hit. Okay. So we've been using this, or, or I mean, I don't do the experiments, but uh, our collaborators have been using this in the experiments that we ran. So this is a histogram of the number of hits, number of known hits versus position. So there are a bunch of known sequences that are much longer, uh, sorry, number of known hits versus length of that hit. So there was one known hit of length, well maybe it was length 10, one known hit of length 12 that were in other papers discovered using a method called, method called phage display. Uh, and then there were a bunch of uh, proteins, long proteins from nature, uh, whose length was you know, in the hundreds or thousands. Um, so after one round of this, this was the new histogram. So we found a bunch that were, I think, I think maybe we, we, we were conservative when we told it that we wanted to find peptides whose length was less than 21. Uh, and we found a bunch whose length was 20. And oh no, what we had done was, 
we were nervous that this wouldn't work at all, and so we mixed in a bunch of random, randomly selected peptides chosen using by mutating known hits. So we found a bun bunch whose length was 20, and uh, then we found a bunch of shorter ones. And then after two more rounds of pool, we found, uh, uh, oh, maybe this is 10, and this is 11 and 13. So we found one whose length was 10, which was shorter than the, the previously shortest known. Okay. Yeah, one round is how long? Three rounds? Yeah, basically. Uh, because it, the experiment takes, you know, maybe one week, maybe two weeks, but then it takes a while to get time on the, appar on the, on the experimental apparatus. Yeah. So in practice, yeah, maybe, maybe two months, maybe three months. Yeah. Um, so we're also using this project in a, in a number of other projects. Uh, I sort of am running out of time, so I don't really want to say very much about I don't have time to say very much about each of these projects. But so one is, uh, we've been talking to Paulette Clancy um, about, uh, and, 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 and a number of other people here at Cornell about organic semiconductors. We've been working with a group uh, also involving peptides, finding peptides that bind specifically to metals. This is with a number of people at Buffalo, and then also someone in Miami, and someone at Deakin University in Australia. We've been working on finding stable, small interfering RNA with Chad Merkin's group at Northwestern. Um, and then we've also been involved in some drug discovery efforts on a, a little known pediatric bone cancer called Ewing sarcoma. Okay, so um, let me just stop there and, uh, and ask you guys if you have any questions. So thanks very much. Yeah, Chris. Uh, does this analysis really tell you why this mutation approach of your collaborators is, is better than the, than the, than the ranking? Yeah, I think it's because the known hits tend to have large values. So what really matters for a hit is this ratio. So theta hit. Uh, I is the column, and then X, uh, and then XI is the row. So this is the amino acid at position I for peptide X. So what matters, what makes, according to our model, what makes a peptide X good is if this thing is large for each I. In other words, if the product over I is large. So if you have a known hit, and you mutate it, and you don't mutate too many positions, then you don't really mess up what that hit was doing. So I think that's why mutating known hits actually works pretty well. Other question? Yeah. Is there a way to generate um, a matrix of just weights, which would weight which position is the most important? For example, if you start with 12 positions, but then you Yeah, I think one of the models that we talked about had an extra entry in the in this matrix, which was like a blank. I think that what we actually implemented doesn't have that in it. Um, but if you had that, then that would kind of. Would it be similar to the mutation approach where um, you keep the most important position? Yeah, you could you could take something like I guess I shouldn't have written in green because it's hard to see, but um, for each position you could look at the max. You could look at the max over uh, x i of that quantity, and that's kind of the value of having the ability to put something at that position, and then you could you could rank positions by that quantity, and you could choose on threshold or something and say that like if it's above that, then we think that that position is important. If it's below that, we think it's not. And then you could, yeah, you could use some kind of directed, um, you know, mutation approach 
based on that kind of a thing. And you could, that would be, you know, that would be an interesting benchmark, I think. Yeah. This is this is green fluorescent protein foam. This cat. Yeah. If you go on the web and just type in green fluorescent protein, you see some cool stuff. There's like monkeys that have it, and uh, yeah, it's pretty neat. Any other questions? All right. Oh, oh yeah. yeah. Go ahead, Fernando. So for the method to be effective, it sounds like you need to have some amount of data for every round. But yeah. It wouldn't be like a lower threshold. If I have say fifty. Well, so I think you can get a feeling for that from this picture. Um, um, I guess I had it here. So, you know, this is telling you what the probability of finding a shorted hit is as a function of the number of peptides tested. And so you can pull off, you know, at 50, it's, you know, whatever, 90, 95, call it. And so I would say that, yeah, based on this simulation experiment, it is reasonable to hypothesize that it would work pretty well for a sample size of size 50, maybe even all the way down to 20. Yeah. Yeah, and you know, this kind of a nice a side benefit of doing this analysis is not just that it tells you what experiments to run, it also tells you how likely your experimental setup is to succeed. So one thing that we're imagining doing is taking this kind of approach and someone comes to us with a you know, three-year project that's going to cost you know, uh, $5 million and we can run this analysis and we can tell them, okay, how likely is that to succeed? Any other questions? So this, yeah. this is from a simulation. This so is based on simulation. verified in terms of actual... Uh, no, no. So this is based only on simulation. Uh, in order to verify this in practice, um, you could, and actually we have the data to do this, and, and we could probably do this analysis. So what you can do is you can, um, you know, we have 500 peptides to test. We test 250 that came from this method, 250 that came from this method or this method, and then we, uh, we, we won't know. Then maybe we could, um, we could kind of randomly interleave. Uh, I guess, you know, one, oh, you know what you could do is you got training data and you, you split up your training data into pieces. You split it up into 10 pieces. And then for each piece, you run your method and you get 20 peptides to test. And then, uh, so that's gonna give you 200 peptides to test and then you do that for, for for uh, two different methods, so that's 400 peptides to test. Then for each of those, each of those 10 chunks of training data, that's like a separate evaluation of your method. And you can now plot as a function of, you know, zero through 20, how many of the, uh, so zero through 20, you calculate for each number, how many of those 10 different um, kind of separate evaluations of your method came up with a short hit, okay? And you get the empirical probability of a short hit uh, as a function of the number of peptides for two different methods. And actually, that would be a really interesting evaluation to run, but, but we haven't run it. Yeah. All right, let's finish. Thanks, guys. Happy Halloween.